And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I am your host, Sherrard, live on location at Theater 68 in North Hollywood for a very special segment of our show this evening. This evening, we're going to be talking about to sign or not to sign. Should recording artists still be pursuing record deals, or should they go on solo with social media and all of the press they can receive this day? So I have three very, very special guests that's going to be on the show today. One is a legend. And they're going to be talking about giving their opinions on should artists sign or should they go ahead and pursue it on solo. So I'm very excited. Definitely um, subscribe to my YouTube channel at The Sherrard Show, as well as on WCOBM.TV where you can be able to see the episodes live as well. And then also um, definitely check us out on Facebook at The Sherrard Show. I don't know about you, but I'm very, very excited and happy to be here. And I hope you are as well. So you can always give me a response. Let me know how you're feeling this Saturday afternoon. But in some sad news before we begin the show, we want to give our condolences out to the legendary comedian uh, John Witherspoon, who passed away this past Tuesday um, from a heart attack. We want to give our well wishes to the family. And we really enjoyed uh, John. I don't know, I know he's touched so many people's lives with his, with his humor and his comedy going back from the red. Where'd you get the mushroom shirt? I'm trying to impress you, you know that. I know, yeah. now where'd you get the mushroom shirt? I got to know. Well, the secret is you've got to coordinate. Uh huh. Most people don't coordinate. See, so you got to coordinate. In the bathroom. Oh, man, I'll wait till you come out. Boy, bring your ass off up in here. What you talking about? You wait till I come out. I smelt your for 22 years. Now you can't smell mine for five minutes. Comedy going back from the Red Fox days. He's worked with uh, so many great people like Paul Mooney, Richard Pryor. He is going to be missed. Uh, we miss you, buddy. So um, also, we're going to have a very special segment on our show starting called Yoki's Corner, ladies and gentlemen. Yoki is a recording artist from Chicago, and she's also a, uh, a songstress and then a songwriter. And we're going to be hearing from her in about five minutes on the show. And we're going to get her take on should artists sign or not sign. I'm Sherard. Buckle up. We'll be right back right after this. Hi, Yoki. Hi, this is Yoki. Hi, it, well, who, well, look who here. This is this is Yoki. Um, I really appreciate you calling in, Yoki. Um, Yoki from Chicago. She's a songstress. She's a, also a music writer, and also she's going to be doing a weekly segment on the Sherrard Show called Yoki's Corner. And she stopped by the Sherrard Show to give some advice today. You have a very interesting book that you have for artists, and as well as insight on teaching artists how to get paid. Is that correct, Yoki? Yes, but uh, the best kind of pay is that free money called grant money to run. I'm a grant researcher. Uh-huh. And I started as a, a song songwriter mm -hmm. looking for grants to do my TV project. And once I found out where the free money was, I'm like, oh my goodness, us artists need to learn about this free money. So you mean to tell me, so Yoki, there's artists out here that can get free money just for being an artist? Siobhan, I started 20 years ago on this journey learning about this grant money. Mm -hmm. And I found out where the Wow, and I thought it was only grant money just for going to college, but you can get grant no, money. No, that's, that's the scholarship money. I've actually written a grant book and a scholarship book. Wow. And the scholarship book has the foundations giving away free money from A to Z. That is incredible. So now, Yoki, um, just to, to tell a little bit about you um, for the audience who are just tuning in, Yoki is a song maker. She's a grant researcher and a national artist and non-for-profit consultant. She's also the author of the book, Yes, I Need Some Money. <laughs> and the, and the, that is a very good book. Now, Yoki, where can someone purchase this book, Yes, I Need Some Money? I think we can all agree to that. Mm -hmm. I want people to be able to contact me if they have questions or for me to direct them to a specific type of grant. Mm -hmm. Like the, uh, the way this works, you know, the government gives every state grants for artists, millions of dollars every year. Mm -hmm. 
So you mean tell me I can get fifteen thousand dollars for saying roses are red, violets are blue, I like chicken, and so do you, and I can get fifteen grand for that? Is that right? Yeah, but it has to go through with a review board, and mm -hmm. they can make a certain amount of artists every year, as well as they give grant money for arts organizations and cultural centers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time I have studio owners call me, and they are for profit LLC. Uh huh. So I tell, yeah, I tell you to set up a nonprofit art organization, and then that way they can get grant money to help uh, create programs for artists. Wow. One of my uh, contacts you read, mm -hmm. um, the highest grant in the world so far has been $5 million. Uh huh. And yeah, he set up a, uh, a studio and a school to help young artists. Wow, wow. So, so yo, let me ask you a question now. Now, what type of grants have you found for people? Because people want to know, like, you know, can they, being in the industry, what kind of grants can you get for them? Well, for the artists, those are called individual artists, uh, mm -hmm. and they have different names, like there's a grant to help with TV education, grants that help with help pay for studio time, grants that help pay when you uh, do music composition. But see, another thing artists have to learn before they submit their work, they need to make sure it's copyrighted with the Library of Congress. So wow. That's what we do that way. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. me and I found grants for non-profits, uh, general operations support. Mm -hmm. That's the grant to pay the bills for the non-profit and pay for the staff. Like, Wow, you've got, you, you've got a lot of people interested in um, what you're just saying right that right now because so many people did not know that um, in terms of what you're offering and what you can do. Now, what services in particular do you offer for those who are interested in uh, taking on your services? Well, I teach individuals how to set up nonprofits and get their 501c3 certified. Mm -hmm. I teach them how to get That, that is some good stuff. Now, Yoki, um, you know, so what you're basically going to do is wipe out the starving artists because of the uh, scholarships you can get. I'm not sorry, the grants you can get for them. Is that correct? Yeah, we don't need to use those kind of starving artists. Nobody that knows just the song that needs to be starving. I think you have to get your free money, okay? Now, now, Yoki, I want you to give me a grant on um, bringing back the Jerry Curl. Can you get a grant for that? No, I can't bring, we ain't going to bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, you're, out. you're throwing me under the bus. Well, well now, Yoki, we really so much appreciate you. Now, your information is going to pop up on the screen for those who are watching um, at home now. Now, where will we be able to contact you, somebody, when they blow up my social media and wondering, who is this Yoki in her weekly corner? Okay. My name is Yolanda. I'm Yoki. Mm -hmm. So, please remember my name is Yoki. Got the key to teach me how to get the free money. Oh, boy. So, <laughs> that's why okay. I, Yoki's all like on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. And to contact me directly, she'll be an email at wisefallmaker at gmail.com. Yoki. And now, also yes. on the show, we're going to be looking for Show. 
Yoki, say it loud and say it proud. We so appreciate you um, in terms of what she said. She's doing big things. She's always been doing big things. A hidden gem of a lady. Yoki, really appreciate that. But just as I told you all in the last segment, Yoki's going to have her Yoki's Corner um, once a month on the Sherrard Show. And then she's going to be coming out here as well to L.A. to sit here right in this chair to be a part of this uh, and interview her face to face. We really appreciate you, Yoki. We hope you continue to have a good day. Yes. Uh, I also help and uh, am an expert in finding grant money for churches. And uh, there's a grant to come out every year for pastors, $50,000 to send pastors on retreat, and grants for church renovation and general operations support. So churches are also non-profit 501c3 organizations. Wow. Yoki, thank you so much. I know you got your email and your contact is going to be getting blown up from all this information. If people have more questions, we can't wait to have you on the show um, very again soon, as well as out here in L.A. Yoki, definitely I appreciate that. And also, I hope you all were writing this down. If not, you can also look on your screen with all of her contact information. And when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have the lovely Alexis Joy on the Sherrard Show right after this. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard, live on location here at Theater 68, having a wonderful time. I don't know if you missed our last segment um, with Yoki. You missed a treat because she gave us some insight on the industry as well as how to get money as an artist. Whether you're a poet, whether you're a singer, an actor, there is money out there for you. So you definitely want to check out her contact information and hit her up. Yoki's Corner on the Sherrard Show. Now, keeping on with the show, this young lady to my right, she has a beautiful voice. She is a Christian young lady. She's traveled all around the world. And her music is about love, love and inspiring people. And we're going to hear her voice later on in the show. To my right is the beautiful mm -hmm. Alexis Joy. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show, our show, young lady. How are you? I'm amazing. It's amazing to see you here. Um, I can't believe um, just how amazing your bio is. Some of the things you've done at such a young age. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm Alexis Joy as you've already stated, and I'm an American jazz singer, uh, but I also have gospel roots. So in a lot of that, which, you know, jazz, you know, originated in spirituals and gospel. So there's a lot of history there. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's what I do. I've been singing all my life, pretty much since I was a baby. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. mother recalled when I was about one, humming. Really? My lap. Yeah, it's real, it's true. Not that I can remember, but this, you know, it's the story that's being told. Mm -hmm. and, and I do, you know, I just would sing all the time around the house and uh, continue to sing and went to school to learn music around, you know, fourth grade, studied music. And uh, after that, just kind of went on this life journey of pursuing the arts, pursuing music. That's all I've done for the most part. That is amazing. Now, just a little bit of information. I know her dad. Her dad is a renowned preacher, a really good friend of mine, and I was pleased to be able to have her on the show, courtesy of her dad, with the special segment we're doing, to sign or not to sign. Now, are you currently um, signed with a record label? I am not. I'm independent, mm -hmm. and I have been pretty much most of my career. Is that by choice? Well, <laughs> to a, well, in a way, yes. Mm -hmm. But I, I did. You know, I went through the time frame of trying to find, you know, a deal and. Uh, I had came out here to LA, in fact, in 2008, 2009, around that time, uh, just, you know, trying to be this artist and knock on every door I could knock on and just, you know. How did that go for you? Hmm, it went. <laughs> I found myself, you know, doing still more investing mm -hmm. of my own mm -hmm. to make, you know, the way mm -hmm. and to make it happen rather than finding, in, you know, those who would invest in me, which is really what having a record deal is all about. Right. Now, now, the funny thing about it is that sometimes it's not even about talent. You know, mm -hmm. you have all the talent in the world, but right. it's not necessarily about talent. It's about opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, that's why you see many times some of the, some of the um, greatest selling artists mm -hmm. maybe can't sing that well. And then you see some of the greatest artists singing in the subway right. with no deal. What do you think about that? Well, you know, art is subjective. <laughs> so what one may think, another doesn't. Um, and, you know, music is also business. 
Correct. Right, and, and a lot of people would argue that it's business first and foremost than anything else. Mm -hmm. In my case, I am truly an artist who invests in my artistry uh, for the purposes of really sharing the art. Um, you know, I respect the business aspect. I understand the necessity of it. Um, but for me, uh, my first and foremost priority is developing the art. Um, and so when it comes to the music business aspect, most of us as artists, we need assistance, you know, there. Because I'm not necessarily, you know, the most business savvy mm -hmm. uh, in the music business anyway. Um, and so we, that's where record labels come in handy. So, so you feel, are you an advocate of saying you would rather be signed instead of uh, going independent and just um, promoting yourself through social media and things like that? How would you feel? I think there are positives to both. Mm -hmm. Either way, you need an investment, you need partnership. Because ultimately, record labels and um, the, as far as the music industry is concerned, it's about partnership. You know, the labels bring the resources of financial, mm -hmm. human resources, mm -hmm. expertise, uh, connections, all of that to the table for the artist to be able to work that for the artist while the artist is able to focus mm -hmm. on the art and which is the product, right? Because mm -hmm. if, you know, we let that fail, then forget the business. What are we pushing, right? But the thing that's interesting about it is that most artists say that their first deal is a bad deal with a record label because right. they're taking a chance on them, so they're not going to give you the benefit of the doubt because if you flop, they lose money. So what would be the inspiration to want to sign when you know going in that your first deal is a bad deal? Well, I don't know. I don't know that, you know, going in, in these days and time, right? Mm -hmm going in is necessarily a bad deal because we do have more as independent artists to leverage now right. of our own because of social media. So you can capitalize and you can, you know, make your own path independently, which is what I've been doing. It takes a lot of more work and effort. And a trunk of a car, right? And that part. <laughs> and a lot more time. Mm -hmm. Because I think that is what you get to capitalize on as an as an artist when you have a record deal is time. You can do things a lot quicker, a lot sooner. You get more of the market share because of what's brought to the table. But you know, if, if you still get a deal and you, you've already been doing what you do, you have a following, you can leverage that. That's very true. But you know, one thing that's very interesting to me though, is like now, um, if you're an actor, for example, mm -hmm. and people want to, um, you know, they're interested in having you for a movie. Mm -hmm. In this day and age, they want to see how many followers you have on in Instagram right. and Facebook before they sure. sign you. But when you um, when we talked to Jim Gilstrap later on the show, he didn't have that privilege. If they liked you, they signed you. But if they it, it wasn't about Instagram followers and everything, I don't know sometimes that seems unfair. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. But I think again, it's you know it's all business, right? Mm -hmm. So for them, for the record label or the movie theater or whatever, they're also protecting their own interests and their investment. Mm -hmm. And they're just not willing anymore to take the investment when they know what we have at our fingertips and the resources we have to use. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're working for it, what, what's, what's one of the old sayings, you know, um, uh, you, you know, you take your own one step and someone will take two with you or for you. And that's just really what it is. You but know? you know, the thing that hurt my feelings like, is that, you know, I was, I wanted to play a pickle in a play, right? And I auditioned <laughs> for it. And then it turns around that only, they saw only had three subscribers, so they didn't give me the role to pick. That was really messed up. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking to the lovely Alexis Joy about her career, um, as well as um, the industry. Should I, should she sign or should you sign or should you turn around and just continue pursuing your career on solo? Many people have, have had great success just being on this solo app. Now when we come back from this commercial break, we're gonna be talking more about her bio, her impressive bio. This lady sounds just like Whitney Houston, Barbara Streisand, Mahalia Jackson. I mean, go on, you just can't, I just can't wait. So subscribe to the channel to see more. We'll be right back. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard, our live on location at Theater 68, having a wonderful talk, time speaking to the wonderful and lovely Alexis Joy about her career and the industry and her opinion. Very interesting opinion about the industry. Um, and then coming up on our on the next segment, we're going to have uh, Ben, I'm sorry, we're going to have um, Eric Parrott. This gentleman is a film producer and he also does the scores for Hollywood films. So now, Alexis, um, thank you again for coming all the way from San Diego to be on the show. Thank you. 
for having me. Now, where do you where do you visualize your career is going to go? Where do you want to take it from here? I mean, you have a you have a wonderful song coming out mm -hmm. about love, and, and tell us a little bit about that. So um, we're we just finished recording my new jazz album, More Than Love, and um, and it comes out November seventh. Wow! Is it? Yes, That's next week. I know, right? Like, so thank you for having me on your show. That's <laughs> exciting. Perfect timing, huh? It is. Divine timing. It very much so. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So now, um, where are you going to have your premiere party? Well, we're working on that. Mm -hmm. So we're actually talking about premiering it here in the states and also in Japan. Oh wow! Now, now one thing that's awesome about this young lady, one of her songs was featured in the film. Is that correct? It was. Yes, I had the opportunity to have uh, my song "The River." Mm -hmm. Featured in God Friended Me, the CBS TV hit show last year. That is incredible. Very yeah, good stuff. My first placement ever, so that was really cool. Really? Now, what would I be able to get you to do to do like a, a soundtrack for the Chicago Cubs theme song? Because, you know, the cameraman and I are both Cubs fans, so we like to <laughs> do something. Yeah, we can probably work on that. Okay, we'll work on that. <laughs> but now, how do you deal with the comparisons that uh, people say you sound like Whitney Houston, Barbara Streisand, Mahalia Jackson? How do you deal with those uh, being compared to those legends? Okay, so I was, uh, first of all, I'm inspired by them. Okay, first of all, singing. Growing up, the only singer I ever listened to, literally, for an entire probably eight year stretch was Whitney Houston. Is that right? My wife yeah. just loves yeah. Whitney Houston. I was well. singing Whitney Houston songs at weddings, and I was in the fourth grade. I'm thinking, are these people really hiring me in the fourth grade to come sing? <laughs> and, but it's true, and it happened, and that's what. So she was probably the most single influence mm -hmm. in my life as a vocalist, mm -hmm. very young. Um, so I'm honored. You know, to have that comparison, but I also um, strive very much so to find my own voice. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah, I have my own voice. And then you're also a vocal coach, is that correct? Yes. So you teach people how to uh, sing and yeah. project and things like that. Vocal performance. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Now, um, you're going to be performing very soon. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be performing at your premiere? Yes. Wow. Now, um, what song? Because um, later on in the show, she's going to be performing for us. As well, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what is your what was what's your favorite? Because everybody has a song on their album with artists. I speak to them all the time that they're just grinning the whole time. You're right. Was yeah. more than love that song? You know what? My husband wrote that song. Really? Yes, he did. More than love. So, um, but I do grin when I sing it. I love it. It's a great song. It's um, very meaningful. Uh, but for me, I wrote the song "Stay Right Here" on my album, and that is a. It's a, it's a big song of encouragement. I mean, mm. for a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, stay right here. You know, one thing I love is that um, when we were growing up, you know, you talk, you take the Temptations, you know, you take Sam Cooke, you know, mm -hmm. you take the originals, and you know, when you pop those in, um, songs like that, you know, if a guy is in love with a woman, all he has to do is call her up and turn that music on, and she'll get what he means if he has a hard time trying to convey it. <laughs> That's the kind of music we love that I grew up listening to. You know, where they're singing to the women and not talking about it. Right. Is, is that what you like as well? I do. You know? I prefer straight talk. <laughs> it's like <laughs> direct communication. You know, and <laughs> it makes you, because, you know, one thing I've learned, and this is from my mom's perspective, is that when she was hearing great artists singing, mm -hmm. um, like Lou Rawls, You'll Never Find, or Lady Love and stuff, she mm -hmm. always visualized they were singing to her. Is, <laughs> that how, is that how you looked at it? <laughs> no. No? Oh, okay. This was just mom. But. Oh, goodness. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I get it. Yes, and I appreciate it. I appreciate the communication, the healthy mm -hmm. communication to women, uh -huh. everybody. Right. So, today. so, so the guy that, that so, so when your husband, um, if he put on some Sam Cooke, yes. just to, uh, you know, <laughs> explain how he really felt, would you get what he was saying? I would. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> Very impressive. Now, um, tell everybody where they could be able to get in contact with you, Ashley, for like bookings mm -hmm. as well as uh, social media. So I'm on Instagram, Alexis Joy Music, and that's J-O-I, J-O-I. So Alexis Joy Music on Instagram, on Facebook. Also, you can visit my website, AlexisJoy, J-O-I, dot com. Now, um, Lex is gonna stick around a little bit longer. You're gonna stick, a little bit, stick yes. around a little bit longer with us. Mm -hmm. um, as we bring in Eric, um, after our next commercial break, Eric Parrott, the Hollywood producer, as well as film filmmaker. And then he's also uh, writes songs for certain movies. You know, certain movies didn't become hits until they had that right soundtrack mm -hmm. with it. And this man's gonna talk more about that, I'm sure. All right, we'll be right back, right after this. And welcome back.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard, live on location at Theater 68 for our special segment enti entitled To Sign or Not to Sign. Should artists pursue major record deals or should they continue going on solo? We just had the one wonderful Alexis Joy on the show. Um, she's still with us, hanging out, and we're having a wonderful time with her. And then to my right, this gentleman is a Hollywood producer. Um, he's also a, a producer of scores for the, some of the best music and the best uh, movies you've ever heard. And he's all the way from Idaho, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the wonderful Eric Parrott. Welcome to the Sherrard Show. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, man. Thank you for being on the show today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Dude, does he just has producer, director written all over him. <laughs> you know, they just have that aura. Now, tell us a little bit about some of the things you've been doing on a recent month. Uh, well, I'm an independent producer, um, director, and uh, I write some of my projects, I collaborate with projects both on the stories as well as the score. I would not call myself a songwriter, mm -hmm. but I would work with, I work with artists to try and create original stories, original score that weaves into the story for the projects that I have. Mm -hmm. So um, all the passion that goes into uh, music, that's original music, and all of the story that comes into an original screenplay somehow has to come together. And it comes together so beautifully when you see these movies. People don't really take it for granted um, how much music plays in a movie. Oh, yeah. You take, um, like, you take, for example, um, the Titanic. Sure. You know, you take that. You take uh, Shawshank Redemption. Sure. You know, it's just the music makes the world, heck, you take Shaft. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. The music makes a difference. So what goes into your mindset when you see the finished product of a movie and now you have to add the music? Uh, well, when you think of it, for me, it starts as director and producer and even story. I think long before everything, anything's ever shot. So I have playlists of things that I'm listening to that are from the world of my character, from the world of my stories. They may not be things that you actually see on screen at the end, but they're things that fuel what's the energy that's behind that story to begin with. Then when we shoot, there's something else that happens. I'm listening to the live sound that gets recorded. Maybe it's thumps in the, in the uh, pavement as your car is driving, or maybe it's something that's caught on the street while you're on the street corner shooting. So then I'll get an artist or a composer that I'll end up working with later, and they might have music that has breath in it, or they might have music that has a real passion that's under the story for a particular character. We'll decide how to use that and whether we amplify what we caught on set or pull it back down. What's the performance that we get out of the actor? And where does that actor need lift? And then where does that actor need us to get out of the way so they can finish their moment? Wow, that's a, that's a whole art form in itself. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, 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 actually, Alexis, um, what, is some of your, what is one of your favorite movies that basically had the music brought you in? Did you think of a movie that just drew you in by the music? The Bodyguard. Oh. It was Whitney Houston, huh? And why am I not surprised? I know. I, mean, I was like, man, I want to say this. It's going to be so. Nice. But, but the music. But, yes. but she did most of the soundtrack. Yes. 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 Absolutely. And I mean, come on, it's Whitney Houston's voice. It mm -hmm. draws your head, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's an amazing thing because you know, everybody has a personal. What about you, uh, Mary? What's the personal favorite movie that you maybe have done or didn't do that the music drew you in? For me, it's the, the music is one of the things that catches me in almost all of independent films. Uh, the music from an odd film that I saw over the summer was *Midsummer*. Um, it takes this story that is very strange, and then all of a sudden you get caught up in the music itself, and that becomes another character. Um, I could name a hundred. That's just one off the top of my head. Uh, um, but yeah, this, the bodyguard is one of those ones that, that is intimately woven between artist and story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it works because the passion goes between those words and the emotion of that, that musical quality. You know, it's amazing that you say that. Like, for example, when I was growing up, sitcoms, the music drew you in mm -hmm. when it was coming on. You know, um, Sanford and Son, Quincy Jones produced that and uh, the soundtrack for that. And it sounded just like a junkyard song. You know, it sounds mm -hmm. like somebody really mm -hmm. in junkyard based upon that music. Yeah. And that's more of a question for Jim. I want to ask his take on that as well. But the music drew you in so much in mm -hmm. terms of that. So do you find it hard or do you just find it it's like never working a, a day in your life because it's so easy? Does it come easy for you? In a sense, it comes easy, but it's patience to see how it's going to come together. Like the film that I'm working on now, I'm sourcing film, I'm sourcing music for the film. 
Um, I'm talking to different artists. I'm listening to all kinds of things that aren't my normal taste. My Spotify list, my research lists are just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. There is no service that's ever going to understand what I'm actually listening to for myself. <laughs> um, but uh, it takes a lot of work. And then I just have to sort of go into a spiritual zone where I'm letting the story tell me what it wants. Mm -hmm. And then I have a lot more to work to try and weave that together with whoever I'm working with on my original score. Now, you're proud of something that you're going to be releasing. Very soon as well. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what that is. Um, I have uh, a film that we just finished uh, shooting. Mm -hmm. We're in post production now. It's called John is Greedy. Mm -hmm. It is a seven to ten minute short that takes people on a wild ride. It's a crime thriller. Um, and, and so you jump in, the, in this ride with the middle of everybody else and you get thrown into where you, the characters have just robbed a, uh, they've just robbed a drug lord and then they have to get away. And you jump in the car, and if you've ever taken a road trip, you know that once you get in the car with people that you thought you knew, things can change. <laughs> oh, wow! Now, now where, where can we see this film? Uh, it'll come out streaming. You can actually be able, you'll be able to hopefully catch it on uh, uh, Netflix eventually, but you'll be able to get it through my website first. And what's your uh, website? My website is uh, Eric Parrot. Um, my actual website for the film is Noisy Crow. Mm -hmm. Noisy, N O I S Y. You like birds, yeah. huh? I see. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We talk about spirit and belief. Uh -huh. That's something that's really underneath all of this. This particular film is about what we believe in. Really? So as the story twists and changes, it asks you who do you believe in, what do you believe in, and where's it going to get you? Oh, we got to check that out. We got to definitely check that out. And yet, I want you, since you're a film producer, I need you to help me on that mission to play the pickle. All right, we got we to work that out, right? To play the featured pickle in your next film. I'm Maybe we can work it into a sideshow performance that's happening inside of another play. I think it's, I think that's paramount worthy. You know, me playing Sherrard, playing a pickle. Anyway, but um, <laughs> we really appreciate you, uh, Eric, being on the Sherrard show as well as you, Alexis. Yes, awesome you. stuff. Um, how can someone be able to get in contact with you through your Facebook and media? Uh, best way to get a hold of me is through my Instagram, Eric, E-R-I-C, underscore, parrot, P-A-R-R-O-T-T. All the links are there. Click the little link in the bio and you'll get to everything else. You make sure you check out his film and all the things he's doing. We're going to have a, him on a very soon in a future episode of the Sherrard Show. We're going to talk more about his career and all the things he's doing. But when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, the legend is going to be here. Mr. Jim Yostrap, right after this commercial break. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard, live on location at Theater 68. Having a wonderful time this Saturday afternoon. If you just missed the last segment, you missed a treat. We had the gentleman and a scholar, Mr. Eric Parrott, on the show, a Hollywood uh, producer, film maker, as well as he does scores for music, so some of the greatest uh, films that you heard. You probably heard some of his sounds on it. You definitely want to check him out, as well as a lovely Ashley, uh, Alexis Joy, excuse me for being on the show. Um, we're going to hear from her, though because she's going to be singing something um, later on in the show. But I'm so excited. My dear friend to my right, um, this man, when you hear the theme song from Good Times, when you hear some of the best songs from um, Originals, this is the voice, as well as You Are the Sunshine of My Life, and so on and so forth. This man is the one that's been singing. He's been around. He's a living legend. He's been around for many years. He has a birthday coming up, ladies and gentlemen. The legendary <laughs> Mr. Jim Gilstrap. Jim, welcome back to the Sherrard Show. How are you? I'm doing just great. You don't age too well. You don't, you don't age too bad. No. Not too bad at all. You look good for your age, brother. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. What have you been up to? Um, just working with uh, Hank Dixon from the originals. I'm singing with the originals. We are doing the Honda Center, I think, uh, later at the end of... You're doing a concert? Yeah. Really? At the end of November. Wow, I'm coming to that. Yeah, it's the originals and I think the stylistics, uh, you name it, they're going to have just about everybody. Wow, yeah. wow. Now, how many <coughs> original members are left of the originals? You are the only one? No, Hank. Oh, my goodness. Hank Dixon. He's wow. the only original left. That is incredible. Now, what about for the stylistics? The stylistics, I think they've got probably two or three members left. Now, they split to Blue Magic, didn't they, way back in the 70s? No. Nope. No. <clears throat> um, Marshall Thompson 
he was the lead singer, and I loved his voice. Mm -hmm. He had that beautiful falsetto, and it just wiped me out. <laughs> like listening to Eddie Kendrick talk. Now that's funny because like, we were speaking on an episode of, and um, I was speaking about David Ruffin's voice and you said you like Eddie Kendrick's voice more so than uh, David Ruffin. And, and for your personal preference. Like, right? My personal preference was Eddie Kendrick's, but I love David Ruffin too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he was, actually they are the two best Singers in the Temptations. Is that right? Out of all of them, of all, all those members, they were the best. Wow. Now, Jim, you've been in the industry for many years. Your career started in the 60s, is that correct? Uh, yeah. In, in 1968, I was in a group called the Doodle Town Pipers. <laughs> and we did, my first gig was the Ed Sullivan Show. Is that right? Now, most people don't know who the Ed Sullivan Show was. That's really, really going back. Tell a little bit, a bit of everybody a little bit about the Ed Sullivan Show. Was that before Johnny Carson? Um, no, that was after Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. But Ed was one of the nicest men on the face of the earth. I loved doing his show. Mm -hmm. And uh, we flew to New York. Um, Studio 57, I think, was the name of the place. Mm -hmm. And they're doing a TV show that one of the late night shows is being done there now. Wow, but, that's a whole week. That's yeah, amazing. But Ed was one of the greatest entertainers. You know, he had the Doodle Town Pipers. We did his show like two, you know, every, twice a year. And uh, it was such a wonderful time that I had. Uh, there was a lady by the name of Teresa Graves who was also in the Doodle Town Pipers. And she was one of my high school classmates. Mm -hmm. And also my high school classmate, Augie Johnson from the group Side Effect. Oh my goodness. We started Side Effect together. Wow. At Washington High School. Now how many members was in Doodle Town? Uh, there were 16 singers in Doodle Town. And we used to play in the Frontier Hotel sometimes like up to six months a year. Wow. And we'd open for Frank Sinatra Jr. Wow, wow. Uh, and then we'd be in the main room at the Frontier with a gentleman by the name of Harry James and Phil Harris. We'd open for them. And uh, the Supremes would be there in the main room sometimes. That's where, where I met uh, Cindy Birdsong and Diana. You know, it was just a pleasure because I got a chance to meet most of the really big acts in the life. But Jim, you were a big act. That's the well, thing. I mean, you were right there with them. So he said you got a chance to meet him. He was one of them. And if you all don't know, this is the face, this is the voice from Good Times. This is the guy when you, you know, everybody's favorite sitcom about trying to get out of Cabrini Green, trying to get out of the ghetto. And when it comes on, you are the man singing it. It was one of the best sessions that I ever did. Uh, Alan and Marilyn Bergman wrote the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I should tell this story, but tell it. they had to take out some of the lyrics to Good Times. Really? Why? Well, because they thought they would be offensive to black people. Even then? Even mm -hmm. then. Now, there's something um, in there. Now, we get, we get uh, you correct me on it, like for sure. example, they say um, hanging in the child line, but you said that's no. not what they said. No. No. What is they, what are they saying? That was Blanky Williams, mm -hmm. uh, who sang a lot. She was signed to Motown, and she sang with Edwin Starr, you know, duets, mm -hmm. and it was not hanging in a child line. Mm -hmm. It was hanging in and jiving. Yes, he had people do that all the time. It's, <laughs> and that, now, they ask you that question a lot, don't they? They ask me that question. I, I used to sing on the road with George Duke, right? Mm -hmm. And we performed with Erica Badu. Uh -huh. And she found out that I sang the theme song to Good Times. Mm -hmm. So she came and asked me, she said, she and I were singing it, and she went, Hanging in a child line. I said, Here we go. <laughs> I mean, No, that's not it. <laughs> it sounds, you know, it's funny because it's so easy to think that. 
But well, that's what it sounds like. Right, right. And Blinky and I, for years, you know, God, we did that back in 1973. Wow. Think so. Now, now, the funny thing about it is that um, I think that in Sanford's song is like the most recognizable of any theme song back in the 70s. Those were two of the best theme songs. And the Jeffersons was good. Yeah. The Jeff Jeffersons is very good. And my buddy is singing on the Jeffersons. Who, who is that? Orrin Waters. Really? With from our, the Waters family. Really? And he sang in uh, the Jeffersons with Janae Dubois. Mm -hmm. and, and she and, wrote the theme song to the Jeffersons. Now, is she in there with you in Good Times or just uh, only the Jeffersons? No, just that's, she just sang the Jeffersons and wrote it. Mm. And I'm really proud because, you know, my buddy Orrin Waters and I have uh, sang in so many recording sessions. We even sang in Lion King. Wow. Wow. That is amazing. You know, it's funny because it's, it's so many stories that Jim tells me about that's fascinating. I, can't, I don't even know if we can be able to get into all of them. But let me ask you a question, though, Jim, um, while we're on this topic. Sure. Now, do you agree from when yeah. you started in 1968? Mm -hmm. what, what year did you get your first record? Uh, 1973 Bell Records. Wow. Now, 1973. Now, what was the, what did your deal look like back then? Well, my deal was strictly a record company deal, and uh, Clive Davis, I think, was running Bell Records, and the uh, it was actually a production deal with a gentleman by the name of. Uh, Jerry Fuller, who used to produce Johnny Matches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he cut a record on me that I wrote called Where Am I? And we did it on Bell Records. Wow. And then later, um, I signed a, a deal with um, Chelsea Records. And I had out a record called Swing Your Daddy. And I'm glad you mentioned that. Now, this is so funny to me because um, my daughter and I were driving downtown L.A. Yeah. And you know this story. And <laughs> your song came on, and my daughter, she's, she's only six years old. She loved the song. She started singing and stuff. And I said, the guy that sings that is a good friend of, my, of the daddy's, and he um, also is a guest on daddy's show. Let me call him and see if he can sing it for you. So I called Jim. Yeah. And he sang that for my daughter, and she loved it. She still talks. That was just the nicest day. I really appreciate you doing that. She still talks about that. And type it to if you're watching right now, just to let you know, this is the man that sang it for you. That is good friend, so you can know that. That was the nicest thing. And when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have more with the legendary Jim Gilstrap right after this. Hey, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard, live on location at Theater 68, talking to the iconic Mr. Jim Gilstrap about all things music and life. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I really enjoy this man here. Now, Jim, what would you recommend, though, if someone came to you yeah. and asked you the question, should they sign with Sony Records, or should they continue promoting themselves on Instagram because they got a million followers? What would you say? I would say... Sign. Really? Yeah. Now, even if their first deal is not going to be favorable to them? It's, no deal was ever actually favorite, you know, to any singer. Uh, my first deal was not favorable. Uh, did, and, you make, did you make any money? No. I didn't make any money uh, with that. I didn't make any money with Swing Your Daddy, which was a, a, hit. a big hit in London. And it went, I think, top 40 here in America. Um, you know, my, my buddy, Augie Johnson, and I started the group Side Effect. They never made any money when they signed. Wow. So, so why would an artist want to sign if they're hearing this saying, wait, I'm not making money. Why, why well, should? if you want to get your record played, and most of the radio stations will not play independent oh, records. Okay. 
you know, and I went through that with uh, my buddy Augie. He uh, tried to get side effects last album on KGLH, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't play it. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, now if they were with, uh, you know, Sony, with somebody that big, 20th Century Fox, um, they probably would have gotten their record plays. I was shocked when Swing and Eddie came out, and KD and K Day was a record station here in town. And I started, I was listening to K Day, and all of a sudden I heard Swing Your Daddy, Bop, Bully, and they played it back to back. That's rare. Why would he that, that is so rare. They never play records back to back. And the only thing I could figure was my record label, who was run by uh, Wes Farrell, uh, Chelsea Records, he had to buy back to back time on K Day. But that did you very well. Playing but that back. record did me so well. Uh, it was incredible. Wow. wow. So, so when, what, what point in your career did you start making money? You start seeing royalty checks and things like that coming in. You know something? I really never made any money as a recording artist. Never. I actually made most of my money doing television commercials. Like jingles? Jingles. I did uh, jingles like, oh, I went to a party and I wanted to see Peter Pan, Peanut Butter. That's you? That is <laughs> <laughs> Get out of town. They so literally, that those commercials uh, from Sizzler, uh, I did so many. Uh, one of my favorite commercials that I did was well, I think I'm going out of my head. <laughs> it was Mother Butler Pies from Denny's. Now, I remember, you know, we, we got to go get Denny's after I'm on the show, okay? Just make sure we go to Denny's. Now, so. one of my best friends is Little Anthony. And Little Anthony came by my pad one day, and I put that commercial on, and he was like, man, what you think you're doing? You do it. Wait a minute. Why didn't you call me? I, said, I didn't know you then, Anthony. I didn't know you then. But wait a minute, Jim. So my thing is that um, that's easy work, right? Doing all the jingles. That to that out. was the most lucrative business I've ever been in. Wow. I mean, some of those commercials, um, they would pay so much money. It was. I used to. My, my uh, great grandson, he says, I want to be like Jim. And my wife said, Why? Because all he does is go to the mailbox and checks fall out. <laughs> <laughs> but Easy they were money. commercial checks. Easy money. So, and, and like, did you do any ho holiday commercials? Oh, I did a bunch of holiday commercials. Um, I did Sizzler commercials, I did Coke commercials. Wow. I, you name it, I did them. And one of my buddies and I, uh, Mr. James Engel, who passed away, unfortunately. unfortunately for us, but he was on that Peter Pan peanut butter commercial. I'm putting that up on YouTube. As that, fact, was, that was, really that cool. was me, James Ingram, singing in the background and his brother, Philip Engel, who's in Switch. Wow. Really? Yep, Philip sang with uh, Bobby DeBarge in Switch. Mm -hmm. And we did so many commercials together, it was ridiculous. Wow. And did you see what it, why I call him an icon? And you see why he is an icon. He's been around doing so many big things, things that we thought, you know, we may just be watching it casually, watching this commercial, but I remember that Peter Pan commercial. Yeah. <laughs> you hear you singing on that for the holidays and also for singing that, you know, because everybody loves Peter Pan, especially yeah. as kids, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But that was the essence of most of my money. The money that I made to buy my recording studio now. And 
I'm so grateful that there was a gentleman by the name of Mark Villa. He had me, Phil Perry, and Philip Ingram. We sang on a Sizzler commercial. How did Jingle go? Uh, oh gosh, I don't remember. It's too many years ago. But we made so much money from those commercials. And Phil, okay, Phil and I did a show called Goof Troop, a cartoon series. Report to the Goof Troop, oh. we always stick together. Yeah. And then I did a, a cartoon uh, called Tailspin. Yes. Oh, yes. yeah, Tailspin, no, oh, yeah. That's a Disney Tailspin. Yeah. Yes. And we started making a lot of money from those cartoons, commercials, movies. Um, so what kept you making albums when you were making so much money otherwise? Well, because I was asked to. And I was asked to do albums. Um, Quincy Jones, who's one of my good friends, he had me singing on his uh, Body Heat album on a tune called Buffalo Soldier. Is that the one where he made you go deep? Buffalo Soldier! <laughs> he, had, he said he, he started calling me the Reverend from that song. It was me and Leon Ware. And uh, Quincy had me singing on, um, oh God, the Brothers Johnson's album. Wow. Uh, I'll be good to you. Remember the song? Yes, I do. At the end of the record, you hear this guy go, I want to take it higher. Hey, hey. That's me. On the Brothers Johnson's <laughs> record. Wow. And so so your whole life yeah. has all been about music. It's been performing, music. Um, I studied music at LA City College and at Washington High School. Uh, I, I was in school with uh, John Barnes, <coughs> Reggie Andrews, who had the dance band, mm -hmm. and Arvin Johnson, Teresa Graves, who was Get Christy Love. And we were all just into music. Now, was your intention um, in the beginning that you want when you were a little boy, like when most people's dream is to be an artist, is that yours or you had another dream? That was my dream after I heard, that's what girls are made for. That was the spinners. Yes, it is. And when I first heard that, you won't believe it, I was out in the field plowing with a mule. Come on now. Yes. You're telling, me, you're telling me the truth. You're out there plowing. Yeah, and I had a transistor radio. <laughs> and I heard that record, and the harmonies were so beautiful. Yes. yes. I got stuck. Yes. And then you know the episode I had where I had Mel Carter, and you were just a huge fan of his as well. That man I'm a super fan of Mel Carter. And Mel and I uh, both go way back to Sam Cook. Actually, Bumps Blackwell is his manager. And Bumps was my manager as well as Mel. Now you're leading us to that story. Now, um, I know we we're doing an extended interview with uh, Jim Gilstrap, but that's what happens when icons and legends come up on the Sherrard Show. So really quick, uh, Jim, let's, for the sake of time, tell us the, the story about Sam Cooke from what you remember back in 1964. Okay, from 1964, I went to, I was still in school. I went to a party that night over near Broadway and somewhere, uh, and I was walking back home past the Hacienda Motel on 92nd and Figueroa. And I saw this crowd out around the motel, and I stood up on this Ferrari to get a look, and this cop came over. He said, Boy, get your butt off that car. I know. And I looked over and I saw them rolling out a dolly, not a, you know, a dolly with a body on it. Mm -hmm. And the policeman told me, he says, he says, uh, 
Yeah, a guy got killed over there again tonight. And I just watched them as they rolled the body out on this dolly. And then I went home. The next day, Bumps Blackwell, who is the orchestrator for You Send Me, he called us, you know, my group was called the Duprails, me and Augie. And we were supposed to go to Tokyo with Sam Cook and sing background for him. He said, guys, we're not going anywhere. He said, Sam got killed last night. He said, Jim, it happened over there not too far from your house. And I flashed back, seeing him rolling his body out, and it hurt me. And every time I hear the song, uh, A Change Is Gonna Come, it's like tears roll down my eyes. Mm -hmm. Because I almost got a chance to go to Tokyo with Sam Cooke, and he was gonna also sign us and Mel Carter. Chisar's? His record label. Wow. With Chisar's records. And it, it messed up everything that I had going there. Wow. But I flash back, I still have dreams about seeing Sam's body being rolled out of that motel. Wow. This is straight from Jim Gill's track. Wow. 55 years ago. That is amazing stuff. Jim, um, one last thing uh, for all your fans and new fans that are watching Sherrard's show. Where will yeah. they be able to keep up with you? Um, your Facebook, Twitter, anything that sort? Uh, I'm on Facebook. And I'm also singing with a group called The Originals, the original group from Motown. Mm -hmm. And I work every year with a show called uh, Heroes and Legends at the Beverly Hills Hotel with my group, you know. Wow. And uh, I was the musical director for that group for almost, I guess about 16 years wow. to do that show. It's Barry Gordy's show, uh, Claudette Robinson, and Janie Bradford who wrote Money. It's their show every year at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And I still sing you know, uh, at the show. And I've been so blessed to do Lion King is out now. And many record albums. Uh, you know, Jim, after doing Lion King, you're gonna be going to your mailbox way more, quite often. <laughs> well, <laughs> I feel really blessed to have been a singer. And I teach sight reading, piano, guitar at uh, Shoshana Payne, Frida Payne's niece, Sherry Payne's daughter. And we're having a celebration for her birthday tomorrow. She is Scorpio too. She's, she was born November the 4th. Wow. And we're gonna celebrate her birthday. Frida will be there. We're both Scorpios and that's awesome. And your birthday is on the tenth, is that correct? My birthday is on the tenth, and Stephanie Powers, my good friend, her birthday is today, the second. My daughter's birthday is on November eleventh, so it's Veterans Day. She got the day off, and okay, she's so excited for her seventh birthday. Daddy's gonna get her a little puppy. Now yeah. I talked to Stephanie Powers today, and uh, she's usually at a show called uh, Inner Voices. We do a Christmas show at Vitello's, the place where Robert Blake supposedly murdered his wife. Wow. I don't know. I have no idea whether that's true or Wow. Wow. You know. You're such that's, that's some amazing stuff, Jim. Um Jim, I know you um we're out of time. Um okay. but I do want to ask you something, Jim. I hope this is not asking too much. No. But can we uh, are we able to at the end of the show after our beautiful guest Alexis Joy sings her song? Can we sing some good times? You can you sing that for us at the close out of the show? Sure. Because we want to hear that in person, if that's okay with you all. Um, we're gonna have Jim come back um, after this commercial break so we can go ahead and close it out with that beautiful song. Jim, the iconic Gil Strap on the Show Art Show <laughs> this Saturday evening. Thank you so much, Jim. We You're welcome, you sir.
and you for me alone. We coming up and your premiere on November 7th, is that correct? Yes, yep, we're releasing the album November 7th. Thank you for being a part of the Gerard Show, Thank I really you. appreciate Thank that. A diamond in a rough, she's going big places, big, big places. Yes. Yes. Gerard's gonna be right yes. there, she's gonna be right there. Now when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna close out with a treat right after this. As promised in the Sherrod Show, first of all, I want to say thank you all for the beautiful guests that have been on the show today. Um, Eric Parrott, the Hollywood producer and filmmaker, the wonderful Alexis Joy, um, Brother Carter, your daughter is going places, I guarantee you that, she's an awesome young lady, and as well as my really good friend, Mr. Jim Gilstrap, but also my ca cameraman, he's so humble, he's such a great guy, Mr. Mark Walker, he is a comedian, you got to see him, um, he performs all across Hollywood and all across LA. He's a super funny guy. He's going places as well. As well as those beautiful viewers and watchers of the Sherrard Show, subscribe to my channel. We really appreciate you. Now, as every time Jim comes on the show, he always has to sing the clothes of my favorite uh, sitcom from the 70s, Good Time, because he's the singer of it. So, Jim, take it away. Okay. All right. Just looking out of the window, watching the asphalt grow, thinking how all looks handed down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Keeping your head above water, making a way when you can. Temporary layoffs, good time. Easy credit rip offs, good time. Show from the Sherrod Show. See you next week.